I'm really happy to bring, uh, to introduce today our guest speaker, uh, Stan Gasek. Stan has a BA and a, uh, and a JD from Harvard in the law school. He has been involved in the labor movement for the last 35 years. He was very important in many different functions in the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, which represents 1.5 or so million workers in this country. But more importantly for us today, he has been an un he has been a consistent, long-term supporter in solidarity with the Brazilian labor movement, doing important work in the 1980s, when in the early 80s, when Lula, uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, was um, imprisoned through the National Security Act for being involved in labor activities. Over the years, he has done many, many things to support the labor movement in Brazil in all of its complexities. Um, in official capacities as representative of the International Labor Organization is also as a person committed to social justice in Brazil. He has two children from Brazil, right? Um, and, and he's currently in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, as the um, international representative uh, of the uh, United Food and Commercial Workers Union. And on a personal note, in, 19, in 2002, between the first and second round of the elections, when Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was um, elected, Stan had heard about me, I had heard about him. We met in a hotel in Sao Paulo and came up with an idea to build what became called the Brazil Strategy Network, which is a national network of NGOs, academics, and Brazilian activists to think about how we could talk about Brazil in the United States at that moment. And we've both joked that we had the right idea but it was, it was a premature idea because what we really need now is exactly what we built those years ago uh, as the crucial situation develops in Brazil. Um, and in fact, we are having a national meeting on December 1st in New York to found a new national network of people who are really concerned about uh, Brazil. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, Stan has to say today. Um, we have, as our tradition here, asking our speakers to speak about 30, 30 minutes or so. I know Stan loves to share his ideas, so I'm going to give him a signal at some point so we have time for questions and answers. Some of us students need to leave for, for classes um, at around that time, uh, but we'll linger on to have questions and answers for people who have any uh, issues they'd like to raise. And so with, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Stan Gasek. Good afternoon, everyone. Boa tarde, you told us to told us. Uh, I want to thank the Brazil Initiative Brown Univers Un University for this unique opportunity to be part of the Brazil Lecture Series. Very special word of thanks to Ramon Stern for all the arrangements and his patience with me. Very special word of thanks to my friend and complice of many years, Jim Green, Director of Brazil Initiative, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown this very, very generous invitation. It's a great honor to talk with you today about a subject of great interest to me personally, but also of fundamental import to the global labor movement and to U.S. unions in particular. Greetings from my union, from our president, uh, Mark Perone. The original subject for, for my talk back in March, which had to be canceled due to the Navasca, to the snowstorm in the, here in the Providence area, was the Golpista labor law reform, which passed the Brazilian Congress in July of last year and was officially implemented in November of, of last year. Since so much has developed on the political and legal front in Brazil since March, Jim and I thought it for me to Im important to focus on the subject highlighted for today's, today's discussion, global labor movement and its support for Brazilian democracy and worker rights in 2018. I'm certainly going to be mentioning the devastating labor law reform in the discussion, but in the more general context of the immediate political conjuncture and referring to the position of the presidential candidates for the second round on this, on this subject. Trying to cover the subject within 30 to 40 minutes, maybe give me a little bit of, of grace time, is mission impossible. I'm going to do my best effort. Uh, Brazil, the current political conjuncture are highly complex, to say the least. Obviously, as we know, as we know, it's uh, 
Brazil is not just another country in Latin America, and as the saudoso Tom Jobim always remind, reminded us, Brazil não é para principiantes. This is hardly, hardly a value-free presentation. Uh, what might be clear, I have biases as a trade unionist and labor lawyer, and as having had the honor of being a contact point for Luis Inacio Lula da Silva in the U.S. labor movement for over 37 years. My leitmotif for today basically is, is, is follows. The protest mobilizations and the actions of both U.S. and international labor on behalf of Brazilian and workers' democracy uh, over the, of the last several months have been based on the following premise. It may seem like a very evident premise to you. But that the, the imprisonment and the judicial denial of Lula's candidacy for the Brazilian presidency constitute a fundamental violation of Brazilian democracy as well as rule of law. And I'll elaborate on the rule of law piece uh, very shortly. Obviously, I'm giving my presentation in English. I can revert to Portuguese during the comienzo taque puxar do gringo during the question and answer period, if you, if you so desire. But why the importance of Brazil to international labor, and particularly to U.S. unions? This may be self-evident to everybody, but I think it's worth talking about the obvious just for a moment. Fifth largest nation in the world in terms of population at now nearly 211 million, with total labor force of well over 100 million, still among the top 10 economies in the world. There are also historical, geographical, cultural, institutional characteristics of Brazil and the United States, which militate in favor of a, a more comparative understanding of each country's trade union system and labor relations system. I'm not going to dwell a lot on all the details, but just a few points of coincidence. Even with different timings of industrialization, both countries share the common 19th and 20th century history of trade union struggle, draconian state and employer repression of the movements, including with a lot of violence, and eventual institutional recognition, legitimation, incorporation, and containment of the trade union movements during the same period with the New Deal and the Wagner Act, of Fra Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the Estado Novo and the CLT of Getulio Vargas. During one of the meetings between FDR and Getulio Vargas, uh, FDR quipped when he was trying to, of course, uh, convince Brazil to, to come on the Allied side and to uh, permit the Army Air Force to have bases in northeastern Brazil. He said, he actually he quipped to Getulio Vargas, it's wonderful to see that Brazil <laughs> has implemented the New Deal. There are economic, trade, commercial, financial, migratory dimensions linking Brazil in the United States, which are very important. Although China replaced the U.S. as Brazil's number one trading partner in 2009, the United States continues to be a major source of FDI, of technology, and still remains, if I'm not mistaken, the larger import largest importer in terms of a country, individual countries of Brazilian manufactured goods with value added. And over the last decade, U.S. companies continue to maintain ranking among the 50 largest enterprises in Brazil. And over the last two decades, the Brazilian giants, the, the uh, campeões, have increased their investments in North America. Uh, in, in the case of my own union, JBS Free Boy is our largest employer in meatpacking. It is actually the largest producer of animal protein in the world, uh, uh, notwithstanding all the, uh, the homos with, with regard to its value and, and, and in terms of all of the investigations and corruption involving the Batista, Batista brothers, but uh, Joesley Batista in particular, but uh, and we're, con we're con very concerned with that as our, our brilliant Brazilian brothers and sisters in our, but we have over, we have over 37,000 of our members employed by JBS Free Boy uh, in North America. There is also the point that there's a still sizable Brazilian community living and working in the United States. Uh, probably close to about 1.3 million, although there's some in this room may just, you know, can certainly can correct me uh, on the more updated updated estimates and statistics. And according to the U.S. De State Department, there are approximately 200,000, over 200,000 U.S. Uh, citizens uh, living in Brazil, and I was I was one of them a few a few years ago. There was also was the official and formal recognition between both governments. Uh, of the importance of exchanging best practices on in the labor area, including in the area of collective bargaining, with a memorandum of understanding being signed between the two governments in May of 2012. With that being renewed, 
in the Obama Joma meeting summit in Washington, D.C., uh, towards the end of June tw 2015. And another very, very important development is that between, for the first time between Brazil and the United States, at the end of June 2015, an agreement known as the Totalization Agreement with regard to Social Security rights and benefits was signed, basically guaranteeing portability and incorporation with regard to Brazilian nationals working in the United States and also U.S. nationals working in Brazil. Uh, now, where the Trump and Timmer governments are on this right now, I honestly have no idea with regard to, with regard to follow-up, although I, I do have curiosity of following up with some of my former associates in the, in the Labor Department to, 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 to get a more precise read on that. And, of course, for the U.S. labor movement, uh, the, the importance of Lula has been uh, predominant. Uh, election of a labor leader, metal worker to the presidency, one of the largest nations and economies of the world, is of great uh, symbolic and strategic import to U.S. unions and to the global labor movement as a, as a whole. Very quick discussion of trade union structure and collective bargaining in Brazil. For some North American union leaders as well as others throughout the world, what has been or what had been the Brazilian system prior to the most recent reform might have looked like paradise. Guaranteed, trade union monopoly, and what had been an in income stream effectively provided by the state through power of taxation, through the system known as the Conte Brussels and Chical. But there are ser I have been always serious issues and faults in this system. One of the great deficits in the Brazilian system is the lack of in-workplace representation and organization, the lack of really empowered unions through voluntary self-organization, although that is improved throughout the years, and continuing deficits in achieving a thoroughly developed culture and practice of independent collective bargaining, although, albeit legally recognized and applied for many years, and notwithstanding Brazil's very impressive record on, uh, on social dialogue uh, during the Lula and Gilma administrations with national councils and forums on all public policy matters. It's important to remember the inspiration behind the Brazilian labor relations system, often referred to as the state corporatist model, as opposed to more contractualist models such as the United States and Canada. Getulio Vargas's vision, one might argue his genius of 80 years ago, was to officially recognize, legitimize worker trade unions, provide them with an income stream, restrict that income stream to the provision of welfare services to the members by making very clear, and the CLT basically still prescribes that funding going to strike financing, political action, and, other, and inter sec sector solidarity actions. Uh, through that, try to provide welfare benefits to Brazilian workers in general, keep those organizations and their use of state finance budgets under tight control, and create the very same system for employers. Brazil is still, I think, probably the only country in the world who actually has sindicatos for employers. Ultimately control the collective dispute system with a highly interventionist system of labor courts and labor justice, with the objective of preempting the use of collective economic force, namely the strike, legally restricting and repressing the strike instrument through what had been historically legal, I won't go through all the details, but onerous preconditions, effective prohibitions in essential sectors that still goes on judicially. And this was the system of 80 years ago. It hardened during the military dictatorship from 1964 to the 1980s, liberalized to a substantial extent, although still greatly intact from the period of the new federal constitution of 88 to the present. Lula and the new unionism represented a, an efforts to bring in a, a new infusion of real freedom of association and collective bargaining in this system. The Timmer labor law reform, which passed the Congress last year, reverses in great part, I mean, practically in, in basically all of it, the labor protection legacy of the corporatist system for the last 75 years. I honestly did not think that we would see this. And coming in just one fell swoop, it turns inside out the collective bargaining system, not to mention leveling a fatal financial blow to workers' unions in the short run. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Force of getting back to Lula, why, why he should have been and would have been the next president of Brazil. Two fundamental points I'd like to make today. He had the Brazilian constitution, the Brazilian law, and international law on his side. But for a politicized judiciary, subject to powerful elite pressures and interests, vacillating, moving back and forth, and basically, I would argue, distorting 
the Brazilian Constitution and Brazilian law. And all polls indicated it would have been the people's first choice and that he would have won, and very possibly in the first round. So these points were very much understood by the global labor movement, by us, provide the impetus for the activism and the mobilization that we've attempted over the last uh, several months. The other side, the elites and global elites and elites in Brazil certainly knew what the stakes were in involved. Uh, I guess we could say as of today, the force of the Lula legacy and the popular support for him is not entirely lost, uh, based that we're waiting on the outcome of October 28th with the Haddad candidacy, although the prospects do not look promising uh, when it looks at the latest polls. It's important, I think, also to recall today that if my arithmetic is correct, that Lula has been in prison for 193 days. Um, the Brazilian Constitution, Brazilian law. Let's remember that Article 5 of the Brazilian Constitution says that no one will be considered guilty of criminal liability until all the appeals are exhausted. And the merits, or one might argue the non-merits, of the original and totally bogus, and I, I will say that as a lawyer, Sergio Moro's sentence conviction for alleged corruption surrounding a modest apartment in Guarajá still has not run its course in the appeals process. Everything that we've seen with regard to preventive, post hoc habeas corpus, the ability to Lula run, that's what's run up the food chain judicially. But still the merits, or the lack of merits, with regard to that sentence of Judge Sergio Moro, upheld by TRF, by Regional, Regional Federal Court 4 in Porto Alegre, still have not run up the chain. So, and let, let us not forget what Moro's sentence was. You don't have to be a lawyer to just see this falls by its own weight. Undetermined official acts of corruption. Undetermined means you don't have proof. Undetermined means you don't have evidence. Official? Official means he was president. All of the allegations had to do with his going to be receiving this after he was president. But Sergio Motors tried to engage an incredible metaphysical uh, uh, rel <laughs> theory of relativity, jurisprudence, to say, well, going back to when he was president, there was evidently an intent to try to be have this apartment, refurbish it, and get given to him uh, as something of value. Un it's, just, it, it's, it's beyond, it's beyond Kafkaesque. Also, let's remember that Lula was acquitted by the Federal Criminal Court in, in Brasilia in July on the obstruction of justice indictment involving alleged hush money payments to the former director of Petrobras. And Article 15 of the Constitution basically says the same thing. Political rights, including the rights to run for the presidency of the Republic, cannot be denied to anyone until their appeals have run their full course. The Lei da Ficha Limpa, clean slate or clean ballot law, passed into 2010, uh, ironically during the Lula administration, was used, relied on, as we know, by the, by the Superior Electoral Court and ultimately by the Superior Federal Court or Supreme Federal Court to deny his candidacy in September after his official registration as a candidate on, on August 15th, say because his conviction by Judge Moro was sustained in the first instance of appeal by the TRF-4 and with a sentence actually being increased by the T TRF-4 by 9 to 12 years. What seemed to be, what I could see, really absent from the judgment of the TSE and the SDF was any serious consideration of Article 26C of the law, which has says basically if there's a plausible prima facie case on behalf of the defense, ineligibility can be suspended. And it has been suspended. Lula's defense on the merits was far more than plausible. And the Justice Electoral documentation reveals that back in 2016, in the municipal elections, there were 145 mayoral candidates that had their disqualifications suspended. 98 of them happened to be elected. Now, some of you may have these statistics. I've not seen the latest Justice Electoral uh, findings for these elections regarding those who would have been you know, otherwise you know, uh, disqualified by the late Aficia Limpa having their disqualifications suspended but I believe that there, are, uh, there is a substantial number. And then consider international law. August 17th, the UN Committee on Human Rights report of the High Commissioner basically said, the denial of Lula's candidacy would create irreparable harm to his rights guaranteed under the UN Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which Brazil has ratified. The committee concluded that Lula should be allowed to run. This decision is binding in terms of international law despite what 
Itamari Chi said immediately, which no, this is not binding their recommendations. When a state member has ratified a convention in terms of international law, that means you're bound. That means you are bound in terms of international law. Now, no blue helmets can be sent, but that's what it means in terms of international legal norms. Very briefly about our actions as the U.S. and global labor movement. Um, been many actions in the, and, and efforts in the last several months. There's an organization called, which is not a household term, but it should be the International Trade Union Confederation, which brings together the Coochies, the AFL-CIOs of the world, the National Labor Centrals, represents over 207 million workers in 153 countries. They've had constant statements basically condemning the, condemning the judgment, the lawfare against Lula and demanding that, he, demanding that he should have been able to run, that he be released. There are the global union federations which bring together millions of workers worldwide on a sectoral basis for various industries and various trades. Our union is the second largest affiliate in a, in a global union federation called Uni Global Union, which brings together over 20 million workers in the commercial, services, banking, media, broadcasting, graphics, and postal and communication sectors. The Congress of our global union federation was held in Liverpool in June of this year. Lula Levy was featured. Uh, Jilma was uh, the keynote speaker, very well received. It was a very galvanizing event uh, there. And there was a whole campaign that was launched amongst uni affiliates to send postcards to Lula, to send notes to Lula, to send letters to the authorities, judicial authorities, demanding his release, demanding that he be able to, to, to run. There have been many visits, a number of visits and vigils for Lula in Curitiba. Sharon, Sharon Burrow is general secretary of the ITUC visited, was managed to visit Lula uh, last, last month. On July 5th, due to the restrictions on visits, I tried to visit President Lula. He knew that I was there. A letter expressing my personal solidarity as well as summarizing solidarity operations in North America was sent to him. Valeska Teixeira, one of his key uh, attorneys, told me directly, yes, no, Lula has received your letter. He appreciates it. He know, and, and he knew that I was there. I did have the privilege, however, of leading the uh, the, uh, the vigil, uh, and there is this, there is this Boa Noite, uh, Compañero Presidente, every night at 7 o'clock with those who are there, those who are there in the acampamento, uh, the vigilia, which are su supporting him, and so I, was, I had the honor of, of leading that at uh, 7 p.m. on July 5th. There have been demonstrations, there was a demonstration against Sergio Moro when he received the Man of the Year Award, uh, along with uh, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, awarded by the Brazilian and, and U.S. Chambers of Commerce in New York on May 15th. There was major labor presence there with the uh, Defend Democracy uh, in, in Brazil uh, uh, NGOs uh, that we were, we were there. There was, on August 15th, the AFL-CIO ended up, this was an invitation to the entire international labor movement, but the AFL-CIO ended up, we ended up the only labor movement that we had a delegation in support of Lula's registration of his candidacy on August 15th. There was a major march demonstration by Cuchi CTB, uh, Confederate, Confederation of Brazilian, Brazilian Workers, uh, Central dos Trabalhadores Trabalhadores uh, do Brasil, uh, with the MST, which converged on the, the site of the Superior Electoral Court uh, in, uh, in Brasilia. It was very impressive. I would estimate that there were close to 20,000 people who were involved in that. We were there. There was an ITUC delegation, including some AFL-CIO affiliates. We were, we were not, I was not personally able to go. They went to the first round of the elections on October 7th, and now the Cucci is now asking that there be international observers, if they can come, uh, for October 28th. The Progressive Caucus letter, which got a lot, of, a lot of press in Brazil, and particularly because Bernie Sanders had signed on to it, uh, along with 28 other members of Congress, basically saying that uh, their Lula should be able to run uh, that was uh, with the U.S. labor movement was very, very involved with our allies in uh, progressive civil society in getting that, getting that through. The AFL-CIO Executive Council issued a statement in July, which also made the Brazilian press, including Folha, stating the same thing. And yours truly, I was involved in AFL-CIO-led jurists and lawyers, lawyers manifesto of August 24th, addressed to the TSC and the STF, saying, that basically making the arguments that I've made today, that Lula should be, Lula should be released and it should be able to run. Now going back, 
to the labor law reform. Uh, and I am going to be wrapping up fairly soon. What are the immediate and existential challenges for the Brazilian trade union movement? Total outsourcing, Tessidisação Total, was passed by the Brazilian Congress in March of 2017. And this basically means, I mean, basically with regard to what had been a judicial doctrine, judicial uh, standard, is that there you could only have outsourcing with regard to those actividades fins, in other words, with regard to the chief purposes of the enterprise, uh, that secondary, tertiary functions of the enterprise, uh, that's, uh, that should not be outsourced. Uh, that could be outsourced, but uh, actividades fin, no. That now it's completely open season with regard to, to total outsourcing. What does that mean for collective bargaining? In a nutshell, and the defenders of this said, well, the tesserizados, the outsourced, will have the benefit of trade union representation of the same unions that represent the direct employees. What they could not argue against was that given Brazil's interesting system of sindicatos for employers with sindicatos of workers, what would be the sindi who would be the sindicatos of the employers? It wouldn't be the direct employer. It would be the associations, the prestadores do servicios, those who are being hired by the primary employer in order to provide these services. And that, what does that mean in practical terms? It means if this is really pushed to the hilt, this will mean a total deconstruction and real, real race to the bottom pressures with regard to collective bargaining within Brazil. Then you have the shrinking of the formal sector of employment in general, aggravated by a very sluggish recovery, well over 12% uh, unemployment affecting 28 million workers with those who are permanently discouraged, the desalentados estimated at 4 million. It's from the latest IBGE statistics of, of, of August. Redefinition of professional categories and economic activity through outsourcing. In fact, the reform which passed in July of 2017 in, in the Congress, what was the pound of the fundo with this? I think I see this, the Timmer administration was playing to the international markets and to investment interests in order to, re to move the reform, pacify some of the interests of national capital. He certainly wasn't looking for working class support to support this uh, from the trade union movement. The debate was expedient. It was superficial. It was confined to pro forma review within the relevant congressional committees. Nothing like the National Forum on Labor Law Reform of 2003 that was, was convoked in the first Lula administration. And there was a certain miscalculation on the part of the trade union leadership that somehow maybe if they had a face to face with Michelle Temer, they could convince him that, well, maybe through Medidas Provisorias, provisional measures, maybe with a special decreto, maybe with this could be slowed down. This would be the termination, immediate termination of the Contribuição Sindical. Rodrigo Maia in the cabinet was not going to hear anything of that. He says, no amendments, no way, no, no way we're going to do that. So what about those unions of employers? Were they screaming? Yeah, the union syndicates employers at the local level were screaming. They also relied on their, on their version of the trade union tax. But the National Confederation of Employers made a very, very brilliant and cynical calculation, in my estimation. They said, all right, we can let those, some of those syndicatos go. But our structure, our confederative and federative structure, federative at the state level and confederative at the national level, we can basically take off, rely, excuse my colloquial or suck off the sistema esse, the system, which is basically financed by the payroll tax of 2.5% per, uh, uh, to, to finance labor intermediation and apprenticeship programs, which the government relies on a lot. It does provide a lot of the apprenticeship services. But the National Employers Confederations are using those funds to finance their superior structures. And it was, I mean, it was a, it was a, brilliant, it was a brilliant move. Now, in terms of giving a, a fatal gold fee to the, to the workers, workers' trade unions. Now, the ironic thing is that in one fell swoop that the Timmer administration and those who supported this you know, within, within, the, within the Congress uh, were capturing some of the banderas of the Novo Syndicalismo, uh, but with totally pro-capital and neoliberal motivations, with advocating more market independence, less regulation to reduce the custo Brazil, Talking about, yeah, there will be more collective bargaining, more segurança juridica, more judicial security and uh, predictability 
But these claims are gainsaid by the reality, which includes an underdeveloped culture of real and independent collective bargaining, and it's creating more legal judicial uncertainty. I'm not going to review every aspect of the reform, but very, very quickly, what concerns the trade union movement the most? There is this provision which says now that the, there, will the, the, there will be a legal prevalence of the negotiated over the legislated. And in effect, the, con the, the consolidation of labor laws was amended to make that. And so I'm not going to repeat everything, but you can see that a number of the very, very vital issues NACE basically can be uh, the negotiated what is put into the into the accords will take prevalence over what is in the law, what is in what it had been formerly the, the standards in the floors within the CLT, with no provision saying that only if the negotiated is better in terms of worker protection will they be implemented. There's nothing in the reform which which says that. It also permits a 12-hour workday, complete. So consecutive hours provided is followed by 36 hours of rest. Pregnant workers, women, can be subjected to potentially unhealthy working conditions if permission is granted by a doctor, and those orders, those, uh, those certifications can be manufactured, can be, be forged. Self-employed autonomous workers will never be considered directly employed, even if their contract is exclusively with one employer. Expansion of the use of intermittent workers who are working on a zero-hour basis. Workplace commissions, this was is sort of the unimplemented aspect of the 1988 Constitution, which provides that there would be commissions with enterprises of 200 or more. But this is a, can be a Trojan horse for unions, because these commissions can be dominated by employers ultimately, and they can serve at basically a parallel yellow union structure, potentially, for, for unions. There are also the Dimensoys called Achievas mass layoffs can be effectuated by the employers as if they were individual layoffs, without the need to collectively bargain with workers. But then, getting to the financing, 80% of the financing for workers' trade unions is basically now legally invalidated. Great part, and we know this, as I just explained, the, the, there was the, the, the termination of the Contre Sans in Chicago. That's, that's in the reform. On top of that, and I think from a legal point of view, it's, it's in an international legal point of view, totally unjustifiable, but since 1999, it was the, thanks to the Superior Labor Court on this one. What are known as clauseless uh, contributions assistenciais, which basically would be, there would be like union security clauses. They're clauses which are negotiated, funding the union for, for, any, for any activity without, without restriction. Those can be negotiated collectively, and they are approved in assembly of the workers uh, once the, after the con contractual proposal is presented to the workers. The Superior Labor Court said in 1999, those can only be imposed on the members. They can't be imposed on the non-members. If they are, it's a violation of freedom of association as guaranteed by the Bra Brazilian Constitution. Um, the ILO put it very simply, basically says, as long as those provisions are collectively bargained, there's provisions in the law for them, they're not a violation of freedom of association. But we, this, is what's, this is the reality which Brazilian unions face. By, and then, I think it was a major miscalculation by the National Confederations of Workers, but I think we were so desperate. They took the case directly to the STF, the, to the Supreme Federal Court, saying, let's make a case. And we're really hoping that Minister Fakin, who presented the, he was the helator, who talked about the constitutional foundations for the necessity of the Contributions in Chicago. There were, I think, some false hopes by the labor movement that that position would prevail, but it didn't. And Luis Fuchs, I happened to be in Brazil, and I watched, was on, uh, watched the, uh, on TV Justiça. I watched the proceedings, and I watched Luis Fuchs's speech justifying his vote. Basically, he cited the U.S. Supreme Court decision of Janus versus AFSCME, which basically says that uh, fee, fee for service dues in the public sector is unconstitutional. Reason it, the whole argument in the United States is that because we're talking about public employees and the, and the action of the state and the state is the employer, it brings in the, the First Amendment issues. That had overturned an earlier well-established precedent in the United States called Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, which said, no, these sorts of, these sorts of dues are, are perfectly fair. They are not infringing. They're not forcing 
public sector workers to join unions. They're only saying that if you're taking the benefits of collective bargaining representation, you should, pre you should pay your freight. By the way, very interesting that Luis Fuchs relied on, uh, on, on Janice versus AFSCME to justify his vote. Now the big problem for the unions is that with regard to the Controusance in Jacal and this constitutionality of its termination, they can't go any farther because the STF has already declared on that. Um, the, other, the other thing is the prevalence of the collective accordus with single employers over what are known as the convencios colectivas, which include all the employers, particular category, particular geographical area, not inferior to municipality. If you take this with Tesseris Asa, which I've just explained, this creates a nightmare. Put it well, let me compound the nightmare. There is also something within the labor law reform that says individual employment contracts will have prevalence over all collective accords for those hyper sufficienti workers with a high school diploma and earning twice the ceiling for monthly social security benefits. In other words, about 11,000 hay ice, which now at the exchange rate is about 2,970 US dollars per month or about $35,640 per year. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is the legal reality. Now, even though the the, gener the Attorney General of, of Labor, Procurador Geraldo de Trabalho, and much of the Brazilian labor judiciary have taken or will take positions that many of these provisions are unconstitutional. Uh, the reform says what it says. There is nothing in the text to make it very clear which says an accordo cannot be inferior in terms of labor provisions and protections than a convencion, or that the prevalence of the negotiator of the legislator only can be in cases of superior protection and provisions. So what can, what, how is the union movement, how can they possibly cope with this? Organize, organize, organize. They're going to have to face this now, that basically unions are going to have to go directly to workers to try to convince them to, 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 uh, to contribute. Um, and the big question right now is, will this have to be done one-on-one, -on -one, or could there be cla clauses uh, equivalent to contributions and chicais that could be negotiated collectively and then approved in assembly? I interviewed uh, the Procurador Geral de Trabalho, uh, Ronaldo Flori, in July when I was there, and he says, we're taking this position, that the assemblies, we're going to defend this, we're going to defend this, that we're not going to prosecute against those clauses that are collectively bargained and are approved in assembly, although this could be subject to a lot of challenges by employers. There are a lot of individual, there are a lot of inconsistency between the, re the regional labor courts regarding the contributions assistenciais, which I mentioned earlier, which unions can still try to uh, try to try to maximize. They can try to negotiate. In other words, they can basically negotiate if it's negotiated the equivalent of a contribution in Chicago. There may be there may be hope. There also is this question: How far do the employers want to push this? They really want to push this whole package. It can lead to dysfunction. It can lead to wildcat strike situations. It can lead to even more unrest. How far do they want to push it? In the end run, who, empl who are employers going to bargain with? I mean, I want to I think that there is this basic Norchi, which I will come back to, which basically says it is we still have to restore some semblance of the trade union system in order to have a functioning economy. One nice, you know, one, one nice setback to all of this, I mean, at, at least on the labor front, is that Jose Weber, Minister Jose Weber, issued a liminar last year, which basically overruled the Ministry of Labor's very restrictive definition of forced labor. Brazil had one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, 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 praised definitions of forced labor in the international community. Do not include ju just not coercion, but also all restrictions on ambulatory freedom of a worker, as well as degrading, alt, all, uh, overly degrading working conditions that were exploitive, and overly taxing jornadas, or work schedules. Those were all considered as part of the formula of defining forced labor. The Timur labor ministry said, no, we're going to regulate this as only being in cases of, of abject coercion. And those have ever said, no, that's wrong, and uh, basically issued a liminar, an injunction, essentially, essentially overturning that last year. What's the position of the Brazilian trade union movement right now prior to the second round of the elections, October 28th? There's basically no other Saida. I mean, basically, it's supporting Fernando Adagi. There's no other choice.
because Bolsonaro is in favor of the golpista reform completely and Haddad is pledged to reverse it. Bolsonaro has also said, he said, you said two things in addition to that. I'm totally in favor of the reform. Plus, I want to see if it's, I want to see individual, individual collective agree, individual collect, individual agreements with workers should take precedence over all collective agreements. That should be permitted. And it's either rights or it's employment. Which one do you want? If you want more rights, there's not going to be the jobs. If you want more jobs, there's going to have to be less rights. And he's basically said that uh, specifically. Uh, now we, now there's you know, full support behind Adagi by the trade union movement. The question is, is it too late? Uh, there's a very, very famous folk phrase in Brazil, I'm sure most of you know, is the Deus escreve certo por linhas tortas. God writes straight with crooked lines. I think the hope of Brazilian workers in their unions is that God is ultimately writing straight, but the lines appear very, very crooked at this, very, at this moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. This is our opportunity to ask questions for, for, uh, for Stan. If people have any questions about uh, his lecture, we can field them now. And I'm going to let you call on people individually and answer their questions. Um, well, let me start off. If people are being shy, I'm never <laughs> shy to speak. Uh, so, Stan, um, let's let's do the worst case scenario. Uh, what do you see as the next? I'm sorry. Let's be positive. Today, right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, what, what do you see are kind of the ways in which you think uh, the U.S. labor movement might be able to uh, help be in, in support of in solidarity with Brazil should the worst happen and Bolsonaro is elected? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, again, we're, we're thinking through this, actually. We're thinking through this right now, uh, trying to look at, the, uh, look at that. And, I mean, there are, number, there are a number of avenues. I mean, there's a lot that can continue to be done. Uh, as we were doing on Lula Livre. By the way, with regard to Lula Livre and Lula's liberation, that is going to continue to be a major, major demand of the global labor movement. Uh, it's, uh, you and I were discussing last night, Jim, I mean, how soon that's going to be. But uh, uh, again, again, it's, uh, I just, it's, 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 it's incredible. I mean, if you look at the Brazilian Constitution, as I was, as I was arguing, he should have been allowed to run. He should, have, he should have been permitted to run. And you have the international you have international law saying he should he should have run. So that's, but again, his uh, his liberation that's going to that's going to continue to be uh, be an issue. Uh, I mean, there are many there are many things to the many 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 actions which can be taken on a campaign front, on a more of a judicial front, on more of the international law front. There is much that can be done. There already was a a case that was brought. Uh, before the uh, uh, Inter-American System on Human Rights with regard to the labor law reform in Brazil uh, being in violation of the San Jose Convention on Human Rights. That can be updated. There can be, and in, in, in particularly if Bolsonaro basically worsens basically the labor law reform, there is that avenue. There is the kind of avenues of the ILO. Again, those are all soft law. There's no, there's no sanctions. But there's campaigns. There's, there's pressure. Uh, uh, I have to say, I was rather rather shocked at the cavalier position of the Brazil, of Brazilian government after the UN Committee on Human Rights basically said Lula should run. Uh, they completely disregard that, saying it's not binding, which is just totally false. It is binding. You ratified the convention, so you're bound. So are these there? Are continue can be uh, these these avenues. I mean, those of us who are you know have some familiarity with international labor law and working with lawyers in Brazil to the trade union movement and also in, in Lula's defense. I think we will continue, we will continue to collaborate. But with regard to, but also with regard to coping with this reality, and our union is being involved, and we're going to be, I, I'm going to have the, the, the honor and privilege of going to Brazil in December. We are working with our counterparts in the food sector who have basically the critical mass of representation for Jota BS three boy workers in Brazil on how do we deal with right-to-work situations in the United States? 
and how our best practices and our methods and methodologies and our methods of organizing, direct organizing, could assist them. I think unions in the U.S. at the ground level, more granular level, need to do that with regard to their counterparts. That, I think, that's more of a ground game, but it's a very, very significant because it gets to the, uh, really where the rubber hits the road in Brazil, so to speak, with regard to, regard to labor relations. I think a lot more of that, I think a lot, of, a lot more of that needs to be done. So, I mean, to summarize, I would say continuing campaigning by the global labor organizations, continued use of international law mechanisms where we can use them, and more concentrated engagement of U.S. unions with their counterparts in Brazil to try to assist them, and vice versa. Hi, uh, so my name is Kizzy. I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer, but not a labor lawyer. But uh, what I've uh, experienced that after this, all this big reform, a lot of uh, instability came. Right. Like we had a lot of issues, a lot of people that used to go to the labor justice, uh, losing or like damage and so on. Like I, I don't know if you, of course you know. Like, that's uh, the part of that's Yeah, part of the, the first judge yes. that you, like a, a person, an employee came and he lost like, Five, uh, 500, uh, almost 500,000 reais and damage. So I would like to know how you like seeing this type of instability, like because for example, all the uh, the cases that we have before, OJ, they are still like they were abolished uh, no, it's, in the same sense. No, this is very damaged from a legal point of view, basically putting all the onus on the Heclamanche in order to basically to bear the cost. This is. Yeah, that is, that's fatal. That's fatal. Uh, all the more reason why this reform, why the reform you know, needs to be, uh, needs, needs to be reversed. I mean, again, I guess there's, that's also a question whether that can be constitutionally challenged as well, but it's, uh, uh, another thing which I didn't mention, which uh, the reform also actually was intermeddling, actually inter was intermeddling, was interfering with the definition of the majorities that were necessary on the Superior Labor Court in order to accept uh, sumulas or develop sumulas, uh, basically principles and standard uh, doctrines. And the, the TST really reacted to that, basically saying, no, this is really an unconstitutional interference uh, with us. But I mean, I think that's still, from what I could see, that was, that was being challenged last year. I don't know exactly where that stands, you know, within, uh, uh, within, the, within, the, within, the, within the system. But uh, this, this reform was just overstepping in so many ways, I mean, just, and was turning around 75 years. But what you mentioned was very, very critical. This has a real fatal chilling effect on moving forward labor justice, particularly at the, at the individual, individual level. Thank you. Thank you, John.